So let's take a look at some of the different kinds of rivers that uh, can be found in the world. If you decide to study uh, geology, you might take an entire semester-long class called fluvial geology. And uh, fluvial is just the fancy geology term for rivers. And obviously that means that we can have an entire semester about just rivers. There are all kinds of different rivers and all kinds of unique things out there. But um, today I'm just going to look at two distinctive types of rivers to give you an idea of how and why rivers can have such different characteristics. We're going to start out looking at the braided stream. A braided stream has multiple channels. So you're going to have a whole bunch of different channels that basically split apart, and then they'll come together, and then they'll split apart again and come together, and they'll be separated by these piles of sediment. These occur where there's more sediment than a stream can move. And that's very typical in deserts and glacial areas. So you'll see a lot of braided streams in those kinds of places. And well, that's because in deserts there's not a whole lot of water, so there's going to be more sediment than the stream can move. And in glacial areas, there's usually a, a decent amount of water, but the thing about glaciers, these Thick masses of ice are very, very effective at grinding up the rock underneath them, so there's a whole lot of sediment. So what do these braided streams look like? Well, we can see right here, uh, notice these piles of sediment, and the river kind of comes apart, right? One part of it flows there, one channel flows through here, one flows over there, and then they kind of come back together. We can see the same thing here, right? There's one channel there, there's another channel here, there's one over there, and uh, separated by these piles of sediment. During flood events, this whole thing will flow as a single channel, but during most of the time, that's what you see. Now that's a very different sort of stream from a meandering stream. Well, to meander means to kind of wander around aimlessly. And that's sort of what these streams do, right? They kind of wander this way and that way and this way and that way. Um, very sinuous, very curvy. And so these meandering streams have a single sinuous channel. So one channel and it's going to be really, really, really curvy. And these tend to occur near base level. They occur there because near base level, the stream still has energy to erode, but it's not going to be eroding downwards. So it focuses its energy on eroding kind of side to side, and that's why we get this very curvy type stream channels. You'll have what are known as meander loops and oxbows. So a meander loop Let's uh, show you what this would look like. If we had a meandering stream, it's going to curve around in these interesting patterns back and forth like that. So one of these very curvy areas, that's a meander loop. And what can sometimes happen is the stream will straighten itself out and it'll cut off one of these meander loops and turn it into a lake. That's called an oxbow lake or an oxbow. So in these meandering streams you get these very curvy channels, you get these meander loops that sometimes get cut off and called oxbows, and you tend to have a nice floodplain as well. And the floodplain is going to be this flat area between two slopes. So notice we drop down here it's all nice and flat, and that's where my river is meandering around. And then on the other side, we have another steep slope. So right here, that's the floodplain of that river. 
And these rivers are constantly shifting and changing because, like I said, they have a lot of energy to erode, but they're not eroding downwards. So as they are moving to one side, they're eroding on one side of the channel and depositing on the other side. So they're constantly moving back and forth across their floodplain. And we can see this in this diagram right here. This is something like the past... Um, 2,000 years in the Mississippi, and, uh, and this is right along the, this is Tennessee, this is Kentucky, and this is Missouri, to give you an idea of where we are, and here's where the Mississippi is flowing right now, and that's one of those nice meander loops, but all the different colors represent where the Mississippi was flowing in the past which shows you that these meandering streams are constantly shifting their channels across that floodplain. So let's talk then a little bit about floods. Um, floods occur when more water enters the stream uh, and it enters the stream faster than it can flow away. So it's almost like a traffic jam in a stream, right? I-45 near campus, you know, when everyone's leaving school, it, uh, it starts getting a traffic jam because more people are trying to enter I-45 than can actually, you know, drive on it. And so you get this backup. And that's really what happens with a flood. You have all this water trying to enter the stream and it's trying to enter it faster than it can be carried away. So you get this backup of water that's the flood. These are commonly caused by rainfall, heavy rainfall, uh, or by snow melt. If snow melts too rapidly, you can uh, get a flood occurring. So um, this is the Mainz River in, uh, in Germany, and uh, this is on a typical day, and there you can see it in a flood day, right? Right there, normally I'd go walking my dog down there, but not during this time. Uh, this is some of the damage caused by a flood. See that little bridge back there? There's a small river that flows underneath that. But during a flood event, it covered this whole area. Let's see what it did to the road. There's that little bridge, and so normally the stream would be flowing under that. This is not the Mississippi or anything. This is a, just a small river, but look what happened to the road when we had this flood event occur. So these floods, when they happen, can be very powerful forces. So obviously, people are going to want to try to limit the amount of flooding that we have or try to limit the impacts of flooding. And uh, so we use a few different um, tactics in flood control. And you'll see some of these around your neighborhoods. A really common one in this part of the world are these retention zones. And a retention zone is designed um, basically like this. Um, notice this area is lower than the neighborhood, right? You see that little hill. And the idea behind this is the floodwaters that would be flooding that neighborhood end up in here, right? It's, it's going to be a temporary lake. This area is lower than the neighborhood, so all the floodwaters are there. They, uh, they can accumulate and sit there without flooding the, uh, the houses. All of this is grassy, right? It's permeable. That means water can uh, soak into the ground there. So the floodwaters just sit there for a while, soak into the ground, join the groundwater system. Um, and uh, this is what also something we call multi-use, where when there's no flood, people can, you know, play baseball and football and stuff. And in a flood, well, you're not going to be, you know, playing baseball, but hopefully your house won't be flooded. And there we can see one of these things actually doing its job, right? This is lower than the surrounding neighborhood, and we have some uh, water accumulated there. These are effective up to a point, right? There's only a limited volume this thing can hold. And uh, for example, this location in uh, 2001 when Tropical Storm Allison hit, uh, there was so much rain at this location, this retention zone filled up and the neighborhood flooded anyway. So they can be effective, but recognize there are limitations to these. And you can also have diversion channels. 
Diversion channels are like this. They're, the idea behind this is the uh, flood waters that would flood that neighborhood end up um, flowing in this diversion channel and to, to divert, divert something is to um, send it somewhere else. And so the waters go into this diversion channel and are taken elsewhere where they won't cause problems, right? They're taken to a safe location, hopefully. Here you can see it again in action, filled up with water. And very much like those retention zones, these are effective up to a point. Um, the highest I've seen these was in um, Hurricane, uh, which one, Harvey, when they came very close to the top. But, um, you know, there's, there's, again, a limited volume these things can carry. Now, where do those diversion channels take their water? I said they take it to a safer place. They can take it to a flood control dam. Flood control dams are kept, um, the area behind the dam is kept empty of water because the idea is then the diversion channels can carry the flood waters to this zone that's designed to fill up with water and then the water can be slowly released in a controlled manner so people don't get flooded. Um, the only bad thing is in some places they design these flood control dams and have like area that's designed to be flooded and then people decide to build houses in that area, which is really not a good idea. Um, but hey, lots of people do some pretty stupid things, right? Another thing that we can uh, have to try to control uh, dams are, or try to control floods are levees. A levee is, well, this. On the other side of that hill is the Mississippi River. The idea is have this mound of earth or dirt. Sometimes it's covered with uh, concrete. And um, if the river starts to rise, well, it has to rise much higher to get over that artificial hill of dirt to flood the land on the other side of the river. Um, these, again, can be effective up to a point. If the floodwaters rise higher than that, this guy's going to get flooded anyway. And then there's also the problem, these break. In every major flood event on the Mississippi, levees have broken. So it's not really a surprise when levees break in a flood. It's more like, well, where are they going to break? Because it will happen. Every major flood, levees have broken. Similar to levees are flood walls. This is a flood wall. It's a concrete wall, and it has this watertight door on it. So we're standing on the river side, and there's a town on that side. And so the idea is, if a flood is coming, they'll close this door, and then the flood has to, uh, um, it's going to be held by this wall. Now, of course, again, it has limitations. If the flood gets higher than the wall, well, it's just going to go right over that and flood the town. And on top of that, these things can break as well. So there again, we're on the river side. We're looking through that door in the flood wall. And there's the edge of the flood plain, right? There's our hill going upwards. But I do want to point out in the great flood of 1993, those houses were underwater. So um, the great flood would have gone right over top that flood wall. So again, effective up to a point. And that's my random picture of the day. Right there, that is me. I remember where I was sitting on this particular trip. Uh, and uh, I'm rafting the Dolores River in Colorado. Um, it was a lot of fun other than one really annoying person. But anyway, I like whitewater rafting. So Dolores River, Colorado.